So in my last video, the one previous to this one, <laughs> I was talking about coincidences and how my uh, blog and my YouTube channel had exactly the same number of hits when I posted when I posted the uh, after I posted the video that I did. The YouTube channel Bandershot, the Bandershot YouTube channel had uh, 43 hits on it. And so I went to my uh, to my um, blog channel, my my uh, the John Bennett Journal, and uh, it had forty three hits on it too for that blog. And I thought, well, that's really weird. Forty three on each one of them. Maybe the the um, Maybe the blog is is uh, just being fed by the YouTube channel because I embedded the YouTube video address in the blog, so it was feeding off of the YouTube channel. So I was thinking, well, maybe people are just watching it on the blog, and I haven't had any hits on YouTube. And then I thought, well, that can't be because there were some comments left on the. YouTube video uh, which w would mean that people would watch the video on YouTube without watching it on the channel so it's getting kind of confused it's like well that's kind of weird they both would have exactly 43 hits on them and so I mean, what a strange kind of weird coincidence I mean I know maybe it's not that doesn't sound that weird but it was weird to me and uh, I was just sitting there at 43 hits, you know, 43 on each one for a long time. So anyway, I mentioned this to my son yesterday. As we were driving up to the store. And we're making this turn onto the street as I was talking about it. And he goes, well, that's really weird because we're turning onto Highway 43. Well, you know, you say, well, John, it's just, you know, these weird little things happen. But I've had so many of these strange coincidences in my life that I uh, just have to wonder. <laughs> so I was talking about coincidences on the on the blog. So then this weird coincidence pops up on the next, the next on, on the same thing. So anyway... Um, my life has become really difficult lately. Not lately, it's been that way for the last few years. Uh, I won't go into particular particular details. Well, I probably will. I probably can't help but going into particular details about it. But uh, I'll try to avoid it this time. The thing that is the overwhelming thing in my life at this point and it's been this way for a long time now has been this I has been the the chemistry of the homeopathic remedy it's not supposed to have any chemistry according to the people that are opposed to and are the skeptics and essentially the homeopathic community industry, whatever you want to call it, has accepted this, that there is no, that there is no chemistry, known chemistry. We don't know how they, we don't know what, well, like the, the uh, British Medical Journal said in uh, the Kleinian Review meta-analysis where they, this is back in 1992, where they reviewed uh, scientific testing of the homeopathic remedy and came up with the conclusion that it's not a placebo. This is back in 1992. And yet you hear all these, the the outcry against homeopathy being that there's not one scientific, there's no scientific proof for homeopathy. There's not one test that, that shows us any better than placebo, which is, is a lie. That's just a flat out lie. I mean, there's, Plenty of tests, and besides placebo, what kind of a what kind of a measure is a placebo? 
I mean, you need something that you need a stationary target for a measure. You know what I mean? And it's up to the government, by the way, to establish standards and definitions and and uh, terms like that. And it turns out that there's a NIST standard, National Institute of Science and Technology standard for infinite dilution. You know, and it's like, I don't hear any pe people talking about this. I throw it out there and it's like a, just a dead hit. I mean, no response. It's just people, uh, uh. This standard for infinite dilution? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I've been fascinated by this, this, uh, by this phenomena of this, of dilution that, uh, despite infinite dilution, despite repeated dilutions, no matter how many you make, traces of the soul still remain. They say, well, no, it doesn't. It can't remain because it, it, the molecule gets diluted out. Well, the reason it, it still remains there is because of what's called molecular dissociation or just dissociation because the, mo the molecule dissociates in dilution after the six death decimal dilution for the most part. I mean, it depends on the material and how finely it's ground in preparation. But essentially the molecules change into electrons to this process of hydrolytic dilution. They become electrolytes. And this, this theory was first presented back in 1909 by, uh, what's his name? Copeland, Senator Royal S. Copeland, was a medical doctor who became a senator and became the author of the FDA, the FDCA, the Food, Drug, Drug and Cosmetics Act, in which he wrote basically the sanctioning of homeopathic medicine. Now, you, most people don't know that. That's not brought into the argument about whether these, these things have action or not. And the skeptic community, if you can call it that, and they're not really skeptics, they're a bunch of blowhard liars from what I've found in dealing with them for 20 years. The skeptic community wants everybody to believe that, th that this is just pure water, that th these things have no no action, and they'll do anything to to prove that, or to make it. They'll, they'll put you know reason and, and uh, kindness aside to uh, to uh, fight against that, to won't accept it. And of course, the latest thing has been this Australian report by the Australian government. Actually, it's, it's a few years old now. In which it turns out that they that, that, that they rejected their first study on on homeopathy, and because uh, it didn't say what they wanted to say. I mean, if you go over the the literature for homeopathy, there's no denying it. You can't deny it. It's, it's voluminous. I mean, I, I don't know how many dozens, if not hundreds, of Materia Medica semiological registers, these clinical reports of, of the action of homeopathic remedies on the human constitution uh, called M M Materia Medica. And uh, the, the one that is probably the most noted, at least in, in my sphere of comprehension about it, is Clark. Uh, John Henry Clark is an MD, a Piccadilly British MD, back in the mid, early and mid uh, 20th century, who wrote a uh, the, the practical dictionary of the Materia Medica. And it's the only one that's that's listed in, in, the, in the FDCA Act governing homeopathy. They actually make reference to it. And it covers over a thousand remedies and has the word cure in it 1,352 times. I counted it. <laughs> the word cure. And it, it covers just about every condition of the human constitution that you can imagine. I mean, it covers just about every disease. Some of the terms for them are a lot of old, older than, than what's currently being used. But uh, so there you have examples of the literature, both in, in reference and in law, 
that established homeopathy is a real is a real thing. Anyway, to get back to the Kleinian review, the Kleinian review came up with the conclusion that that homeopathic remedies are not placebos, as have others like Lind. The Lind review meta analysis of homeop homeopathy came up with the same conclusion, and just about every other. Uh, meta-analysis has done the same thing. It's con concluded that these are not placebos. And again, what the hell is a placebo? Placebo technically is something that means to placate, to please. So, I mean, what does it mean? It means that it's a, it, they usually refer to that it's a sham treatment that's simply there to kind of hypnotize the, the, uh, the patient and because he's feeling good about it, it's, he thinks it works or something. In other words, it could have, it'd be some psychosomatic effect. That's, that's not a baseline to, to do these things on. The baseline is whether they have any kind of non-human action. Did they work on plants? Yeah, it turns out they work on, it works on plants. Homeopathic remedies stimulate and can retard plant growth. Same is true with, uh, that there's reaction by animals, but more interestingly enough, are the biochemical actions of homeopathic remedies. And like the Basfield did granulation test that Jacques, Jacques Benveniste uh, is famous for being crucified on, <laughs> is uh, the Basfield de granulation test. So you gotta ask yourself, what the hell is going on here? I mean. It, the, the test that, that Ben Venice was noted for was a replication in itself. They say, oh, it's never been replicated. Yeah, it has been replicated. It's been replicated at least by the, by the early 2000s. It had been replicated a couple dozen times by multi-centered tasking by some pretty, pretty good scientists like Madeline Hennis of the Queen's University in Belfast, Ireland. The professor of pharmacology that did a a replication of the basophil degranulation test. In other words, these and that's not the only biochemical test. In other words, these these substances used in homeopathy have been tested biochemically and they've been shown to have an effect on on, on at the cellular level. So the Kleinian review so we could accept homeopathy as a clinical, um, for clinical use, if we knew what the mechanism was, if the mechanism could be described. Well, guess what? The mechanism has been described. And that's what I've been pr primarily focusing on these last few years. And it's process of converting the molecule to an ion is called molecular dissociation and it continues to dissociate the the, the particle and I say particle with, with quotes around it because by the time it dissociates now it's not not really any longer a particle it's a wave it's an electron it becomes an electron and which leads us to an interesting point in science or in physics that the electron is not considered in conventional science as being or I mean it is considered as being a fundamental particle which means they don't think it has any structure they think that that it's a the electron as a fundamental product particle has no structure then you, you, you probably Hearing this at the first time would think, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Of course the electron has a structure, and homeopathy proves it. Homeopathy proves the specificity of the subatomic field. It proves the specificity of the subatomic field. What does that mean? It means that the properties still remain of that molecule within, within the particle below it, within the ion, the, the, the plasma, the electron that is taken from it. What does that suggest? Well, that suggests that the molecule is essentially a collection of 
of ions, of electrons, and that it is a holistic it is a holistic entity. In other words, you can take a piece of it, and everything else within that molecule is represented in that piece. So it's a holistic. And I believe that this holistic feature, this holistic specificity, is an infinite rabbit hole, and that these particles are not assemblies of particles, they're fractals. So like, like a lightning strike, a lightning strike would be a good example of a fractal. It's all connected, right? I mean, we don't think of a lightning, of lightning as being a, a particle. We think of it as being a, well, we don't, I can't even think of a good name for what you'd call the, the appearance of lightning. A bolt, a lightning bolt. So anyway, this is what I've been struggling with. And it just gets, it gets to be, at least for me, it gets to be fascinating. Not only in its intricacy, but also in this, the reaction to it by so-called scientists. It's a kind of a pathological denial. Well, I've been blathering on about this for 15 minutes and much longer than I intended to. So I appreciate your comments. We don't talk about these things enough, I don't think. We're not talking about it because what this leads to is a redefinition of immunology, a redefinition of immunology. Because these, these substances used in homeopathy have been shown to be effective against the transmission of disease. They've been effective in, in stopping epidemics. And of course, the, the authorities don't want to believe it. So it didn't happen, it must be a lie, but the, it's been demonstrated quite dramatically during the Cuban leptospirosis epidemic recently. So, but we've seen that in numerous epidemics for the last couple hundred years that homeopaths have used homeopathic remedies to inoculate and to cure epidemic diseases. So I think that we're, we're in, denying this technology or cheating ourselves out of a, a very effective form of immunization. And what's more, I know I was gonna shut up and hang up here, but I have come to the conclusion that the operative feature, the operative mechanism of the vaccine is essentially the same as it is in the homeopathic or the supramolecular prophylaxis, vaccine, which is a stupid word, meaning from a cow. It, and the difference is, is that basically it's a very crude, the current vaccine, what are used as vaccines, don't really follow any kind of a coherent kind of, uh, kind of theory or, or strategy it's like they don't know what it is. They don't understand that, that the immunizing factor mechanism of the crude molecular vaccine is the electron. And if you strip away all this added mass, you have a very effective, clean, green, supramolecular vaccine. It doesn't have all these poisons and uh, like adjuvants, like mercury and stuff that they have to insert in their regular vaccine in order to make it effective in order to arouse the immune system to act on it, to get it to take, they used to say taking. So I think we're, we're on the verge of a breakthrough. If we can get the World Health Organization on board with this, a lot of these rampant epidemic diseases in some of these third world countries could be um, annihilated, annihilated. You know, we annihilated smallpox and essentially, it was done homeopathically when you look at it. I know that people that just freaks people out when they hear me say that, but it's true. Because the basic strategy of the vaccine is the same as it, of the smallpox vaccine is the same as it is in homeopathy, which like cures like. They use cowpox to cure smallpox. Cowpox is a disease that is, uh, comes from cattle. So as you can see, this gets wider as it gets deeper. 
And I, I'd, like, I'd like some help on it. I'm just a, an old sick man, <laughs> a sick old man who kind of feels like he's fighting this fight alone. I don't know anybody else is going, hey, John, you're right. You hadn't thought of that before. And everybody's too proud to say that. So anyway, I love you anyway. I still, still love you all. I'm still here, still kicking, still squirming, still belly crawling up to the dinner table every now and then. And uh, leave a comment or something. I'd like to hear from you. Gosh, look at this, 19 minutes and 57, 58, 59 seconds. Goodbye. 20 minutes.